The BMAT is an exam with three sections, but they vary greatly. What works for one section may not work for the other two. In this video, we'll be going through each of the sections in detail and coming up with strategies which you can use to boost your overall BMAT score. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. My name is Rohan. I'm a second year medical student studying at the University of Cambridge. In this video, we're going to go through each of the three sections of the BMAT exam and try to think of key things to bear in mind when approaching each section. If you haven't already done so, please watch my previous video on the BMAT where I give some tips on how we can best prepare for the BMAT and be in best shape come exam day. So anyway, we're going to go through each section in turn. There are timestamps in the description box below. Let's get started. So, to recap from the last video, in section 1, there are 15 critical thinking questions and 20 problem solving questions. This equates to just over one and a half minutes per question. Of the two, critical thinking questions are more preparable and more formulaic than the problem solving questions. This is why I advise you spend probably closer to one minute per question on critical thinking questions. Most questions involve reading a short passage of text and identifying the main conclusion, or the main assumption made by the author, flaws in the argument, or anything that strengthens or weakens the argument made. To many people, this style of question may come naturally. However, for others, it will be less obvious. And if you are struggling, maybe it's a good idea to look at an AS critical thinking textbook, which would probably give you an in-depth explanation for each of these question types and the theory behind it. However, I would recommend looking at the notes on BMAT Ninja and my notes are kind of exclusively based on these, hence I can't really share everything because that resource is behind the paywall. They give you a concise breakdown of each question and how to answer them. They go over stuff about how to find conclusions quickly by looking for specific words, how to test if something is an assumption, common flaws which are in arguments and what types of things strengthen or weaken arguments. Definitely check out BMAT Ninja, there's a link in the description box below. Another thing to note about section one is that it's really similar to the section one of other Oxbridge admissions tests, such as the TSA or the IMAT or the old BMAT specification. BMAT Ninja has collated all these questions into a single question bank, so everything's ready for you just to get cracking. And just one more thing to note, is that this year the exam is slightly different due to the pandemic. I think the exam is supposed to be sat online this year rather than through pen and paper. So one thing to check is if you can actually highlight the text because I knew when I was doing the exam through pen and paper, I found it really helpful to highlight the key sentence in the paragraph which the question had. That is something to check on the official website to check if that's possible. Moving on to problem solving questions, unfortunately these are less preparable and they're probably a little bit harder. So you want to be spending close to two minutes per question. These questions have more data analyses and they're very similar to the ones which you might have come across in decision making in the UCAT exam. So although they are less preparable, there are some things you can do to make your approach more efficient to these questions. So one thing is to get sharper at your mental maths. Being able to work stuff out in your head and also on pen and paper will really help. Because remember, the BMAT is a non-calculator exam. Secondly, just like the UCAT in quantitative reasoning, know the conversions for common fractions into decimals and percentages and vice versa. And finally, use estimation to your advantage. For example, if you see the answers are orders of magnitude apart, you can use guesstimation to your advantage. But if they're really close together, then you probably just need to do the calculation. And remember which way you're guesstimating, whether you're overestimating or underestimating. Because if the answers are somewhat close together, then this will sure come in handy to know which way you've gone. Finally, make sure that you check out the free section one guide released by the Cambridge Admissions Test website. They categorize problem solving questions into three types and also tell you what math skills are required for section one. Okay, let's move on to section two. So to recap from my previous video, section two is a science section and it has an even split of maths, physics, chemistry, and biology. And it's really time pressured you only have 30 minutes to answer 27 questions. In terms of each subject, I would rank the order of difficulty from biology being the easiest, then physics, then chemistry, and finally maths actually being the hardest. So taking each subject in turn, firstly physics. Please don't make the mistake of skipping the physics questions if you're not taking physics A level, because these questions are actually rather simple and often just involve plugging numbers into a formula 
rather than understanding the concepts behind the formulae. You can learn all the theory from GCSE, which you might have forgotten, either using notes from BMAT Ninja, or from the official revision guide, which I've linked in the description box below. Start off with the assumed knowledge guide and take off the stuff that you already remember. I think you'll surprise yourself by how much you actually do remember from GCSE physics. Then you can allocate your time more wisely to the topics that you're weakest on. Once you start doing past papers, you'll see what topics come up every year and you can prioritize your revision for them. Again, BMAT Ninja actually tell you what the high yield topics are for each subject and which ones you can probably safely ignore. Next, moving on to biology, the content mainly is human biology, so make sure you focus on that. Biology is the easiest because it's basically just simple factual recall, so it's sometimes best to try and do these in a much shorter frame of time, obviously without rushing, but so that you have time for the more harder calculation questions, which require more steps. For chemistry, get really good at molar calculations. These are fairly straightforward at GCSE, where you have a calculator and you can write out the formula and go through it systematically and get it right. But in the BMAT, you simply don't have this luxury. If you are struggling to answer the molar questions within like the strict one minute per question time frame, I know I keep banging on about them, but on BMAT Ninja, there's a free section about quantitative chemistry, and this covers all the BMAT molar calculations, and they give a nice conceptual way about thinking about moles, which is probably a little bit easier than how we've been taught at school, and it really helps you to think about it intuitively. So definitely go check out that page on BMAT Ninja. Another thing to know is you don't need to worry about knowing any of the periodic table off by heart because they give you the relative atomic masses where you need it, and finally, the examiners know that you don't have access to the calculator, so they actually use values which kind of fit into neat ratios, so look out for them. So for example, most students know that carbon has an atomic mass of 12 off the top of their heads. So if we're given a carbon mass of 1.2 grams, we can intuitively know that that corresponds to 0.1 moles. So in this way, we can use the fact that nice ratios will be coming up to our advantage and get values a lot quicker than having to go through the formula every time. Finally, in the maths questions, some questions are genuinely quite difficult and time consuming to do within one minute. This is where you have to be really ruthless when going through the questions. Don't be stubborn and fall into the trap of going, oh, I got 100% at GCC maths, so of course I'm gonna get all the BMAT maths questions right. It simply doesn't work like that because you don't have the time and you don't have access to a calculator in the BMAT, so make sure that you prioritise your time to collect all the easy marks from biology and physics and don't be afraid to just guess some of the maths questions and move on. Finally, let's go on to section 3. So for section 3, we have to write one essay within 30 minutes from a choice of three questions. One of the features of section 3 is that you really don't get much space to play with. In previous years where it has been a pen and paper exam, you only get one side of A4. If you look at the actual answer sheet, the top bit is actually taken up where you write your name and your candidate number, and you have to put all your writing into those black margins. So in fact, you only get about three quarters of an A4 side. The other side of that is that means you don't actually have to write that much for section three. So it really isn't time pressured. The key, key thing for section three is for your chosen question, you need to answer all the sub questions. I repeat that, you need to answer all the sub-questions. If you fail to do this, you cannot gain higher than a level two. But if you do do this, you're pretty much guaranteed a level three. This usually means that you need to answer both sides of the argument, and if they ask for a conclusion or an opinion, that you provide that in your essay. When you actually come to write the essay in the exam, I'd spend at least a couple of minutes deciding which question to answer of the three. And they usually follow similar themes each year. One question is usually a quote, and then you need to explain the statement. Another one, I'm not really sure how to define. And the third one is the one relating more to medicine or medical ethics. So spend a couple of minutes deciding which one you want to answer. Some people always go to the Medici one without thinking, but sometimes you might have better answers for the sub-questions for some of the other questions. So don't just blindly pick one without looking at the others. Actually consider them and think mentally what points you have for and against and for each sub-question. And also, don't just pick a question because it seems harder. The examiners don't give you extra credit for doing a less obvious question. They're only concerned with your quality of writing. Spend a good five to 10 minutes planning. Plan on the question sheet so you don't take up space on your answer sheet. 
But again, I'm not sure how this changes this year because you're doing it on the computer. And planning is critical to your success in section three, because in at least in previous years where you had to do it on pen and paper, they only ever gave you one answer sheet. So if you messed it up, that was it. So you really have to make sure you know exactly what you want to write before putting pen to paper on your answer sheet. When planning, define the key terms of the question. This will help you stay focused in your essay, particularly in your introduction. Once you finish planning, spend 15 minutes actually writing the essay. This is more than sufficient to fill the allocated space and make sure you write fairly small and neatly. Spend the remaining time rereading what you've written, ensuring that you've answered all the sub questions, check your spelling and grammar and make sure that it kind of flows well. In terms of essay structure, you want to have a short introduction to introduce a topic and any key phrases which have to be explained and perhaps suggest what side of the argument that you're going to lean on. Then have two or three paragraphs answering each sub question in turn and forming all sides of the argument. I usually went for three middle paragraphs and I had two points for a side of the argument I was leaning on and one point against. And for that second point for my argument, I tried to make counter arguments against a previous paragraph. The paragraph structure itself should be the simple point evidence explained. You don't have to do anything fancy. Just make sure that you're keeping a tight focus to the question because there really isn't much space for waffle. The conclusion should have your stance on the argument and justifying why you take the stand. This usually means explaining why the evidence that you've presented is stronger for your argument than the other argument. In terms of practicing for section three, make sure that you do sufficient time practice and print off the answer sheet when doing past papers. Obviously this differs again if you're doing it on the computer. Then in terms of getting feedback, you can ask a school teacher, perhaps your old humanities teacher, if they wouldn't mind marking a few papers. They don't need to be a specialist examiner, they just need to see if what you've written is coherent and kind of flows well. I even asked my auntie in India to look at the essays when I was writing it because she actually has very good English, probably better than mine. She was able to point out areas where I could improve my use of language and how to improve my structure. Also, if there are multiple medics sitting in the BMAT in your school, make sure that you work together as a team. We used to have a group chat amongst the medics and Every time that we did a BMAT essay, we'd post it on the group chat and the others would chime in with constructive criticism of how we could improve. And in that way, we could kind of learn from each other and collectively try and boost our essay score. In terms of what specific evidence to put in your BMAT essays, what points you should be raising, it really depends and you don't have to do any specific reading for your essay. If there's any book I would recommend, it's the Medical School's Interview, All You Need to Know, The Knowledge by Dr. Mona Kuna. And I'll link that in the description box below. This book has the basic information for pretty much everything in medicine, from the NHS structure to medical history and even medical ethics. It is a great base to build your arguments upon and it really makes sure that you have a good foundational knowledge. Otherwise, occasionally, keep up to date with current affairs and look at BBC Health regularly. And if you check out my applying to medicine guide in the description, I've actually linked some useful journals which you can just flick through and kind of read anything which catches your eye, which is interesting. This will help more for your interview, but it will also help you get some nice little facts to just drop into your essays. And that might help boost your score from a level three to a level four. However, don't go overboard on this. The key things for levels four and five is not really to put loads of niche facts, but to present your points in a nice way. This involves good use of language and clear sentence structure. This kind of stuff relates more to your style of writing and more to the skills that you've developed in English at GCSE. I've attached the marking rubric which examiners use to mark section three. So you can check that out for more detailed information about how they mark section three. So that concludes this video on the BMAT, looking at each section in turn and coming up with specific tips for each one. If you did find this video useful, please give it a like. And if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel so you can stay notified for more videos in this Applying to Medical School series. If you have any questions, leave a comment down below and I'll definitely get back to you on those. So take care, happy revising and bye for now.